Hi, we're going to talk about models of cause and effect and why this is important to the epidemiology of substance use disorders. A big question that clinicians and policymakers, government officials, program managers have is, can we establish causal relations through epidemiological research that show the factors that are responsible for a person's addictive behavior and for their recovery. And in order to do this, we need to understand the difference between an association and a cause. An association is a relationship between two variables, usually done in terms of some sort of a statistical association. And it can be between events or characteristics or other variables. A lot of research in addiction is based on correlational evidence that a person's substance use, for example, in terms of its frequency or quantity or the mode of administration is correlated with consequences, whether it's dependence or intoxication or overdose or criminal activity. But these positive associations may not necessarily mean a causal association. An example would be that <clears throat> criminal activity is correlated with drug use, but that's mainly a function of the fact that most drug use is illegal in and of itself. So people get arrested in one country because of their marijuana use, but if they're in Colorado, they won't get arrested. That will affect the correlation. So the association is there in some places, but not in others. The presence of a statistical association doesn't necessarily imply a causal relationship. A cause is something that directly alters the frequency of a disease like overdose or dependence and the health status of an individual who's using that substance. It plays an important role in the occurrence of the outcome, whether it's something like the effect of smoking on lung cancer uh, or the effect of heroin use on overdose. Causes can be genetic or environmental or a combination of the two. And this is true for many complex diseases like diabetes and cancer, but substance use is particularly challenging. So when we are doing research and trying to assemble the results of our research in literature reviews and meta-analyses, we want to look at the pyramid of associations, starting at the bottom, recognizing that many associations, even those reported in the literature, could be due to chance. If we use standard statistical procedures, there's going to be an association uh, five out of 100 times, one out of 20. So we're going to be observing associations just by chance fluctuations in our statistics. Then there are spurious associations or artifacts. These could be due to poor measurement techniques that uh, might establish that something is going on or not going on, like drug testing, when it does not detect uh, drug abuse, when somebody actually is using it because our assessment procedures are inadequate. Other associations are confounded by third factors so that uh, even though there might be an association between height and weight, it doesn't mean that a person's height is the cause of their weight. Uh, the two may be associated for other reasons. And confounding 
is present in many types of research, and that's why we use randomized trials to prevent confounding to enter into our interpretation of the data. There are, in some cases, where uh, an association can be found to be non-causal. Uh, and finally, when we get to the top of the pyramid, uh, causality uh, can be present, but we may not know about it. Or in the optimal case, we have a considerable amount of research summarized in meta-analyses explaining an association that appears by all criteria, which we will discuss subsequently, uh, indicating that uh, one factor is likely contributing to a, an outcome of interest. In this case, the development of addiction or the development of it, addictive problems or the uh, causation that comes with a program, whether it's prevention or treatment, interfering with somebody's addiction career. There are a number of models that have been developed in the analysis of disease causation that can be applied to addiction. The line model, uh, which is relatively simple, the triangle model, which you've probably heard about in terms of the public health uh, agent, host, and environment, model. The wheel model, which is a variant of that, <clears throat> which takes into account these variables in a more complex way. And then the epidemiologic cascade model. The line model, in one interpretation, looks at whether there's a contribution to the development of a disorder that's predominantly genetic or predominantly environmental. And as we know, this may be a continuum, particularly in the case of addiction. We know that addiction uh, tends to run in families, but there is a strong environmental component to it. At a population level, clues that a disorder or a disease is mainly caused by genetics come from stable incidents across societies around the world. Schizophrenia is an example where the incidence is uh, somewhat stable. Another kind of evidence is that addiction might cluster in families. And when that happens, it's evidence that there may be a strong genetic component. But there are many clues for environmental factors in addiction as well. Uh, as in the case of incidents varying rapidly or over time between genetically similar populations. If you look at the variability in marijuana consumption, alcohol consumption, heroin use throughout the world in time series analyses, you find dramatic changes going up and going down over time in the amount of consumption and related problems, including people hospitalized for alcohol dependence or heroin addiction. So that's evidence that uh, environmental factors may play a role as well. So both genetics and uh, environment are likely to be involved in a complex disorder like addiction. The old simplistic model of infectious disease is epitomized by the uh, famous epidemiological research conducted by John Snow in Golden Square in London in the 1850s, where there was a cholera epidemic that broke out in this neighborhood in West London. People were dying rapidly. Entire families were being wiped out within 24 hours. And Jon Snow began to investigate where the disease incidence was located by interviewing people and creating what is called the ghost map, which identified the houses where people were dying. He also collected additional data to document 
where people were getting their water. And even before the mechanism of bacteriology was known that explained how the cholera was transmitted and how it got into the human intestinal system. Even before that, Jon Snow was able to identify a clear association. And by taking the handle off of the pump that was contaminated with cholera bacteria, he was able to stop the epidemic. So that's kind of an idealistic solution to a complex, life-threatening epidemic that exists in the history of public health. But the question is, does that apply to the predominant causes of death in the modern world? And if you consider the prevalence rates of heroin addiction, cannabis dependence, other drug use, as well as the enormous impact of alcohol consumption and tobacco consumption, we're dealing with a set of factors and causal mechanisms that are much different than in Jon Snow's day. And the Jon Snow pub would be a good place to study the epidemiology of substance abuse in terms of its um, determinants, because people come in regularly, some of them are susceptible, others are not. That brings us to the public health model of host, agent, and environment. Here, the underlying cause of a disease is considered to be the result not of an infectious agent necessarily or a completely genetic or environmental cause, but a combination of the characteristics of the host, the type of agent uh, or substance in this case that people are taking, and the environment in which it's taken. So we can analyze these various components in the epidemiologic triangle in order to better explain the relative contributions of agent, host, and environment. And a lot of epidemiological research has been devoted to sorting out the various contributions based on this model. A variant of the epidemiologic model uh, is a, um, a circle. And the circular model looks at the envelope provided by the physical environment, the social environment, and the commercial and biological environment that often govern the agent, in this case, which is alcohol or other drugs or tobacco. This model emphasizes the unity of the gene and the host. So each of us comes to our environment with a particular genetic susceptibility. And that susceptibility gets uh, played out depending on social factors, physical factors, and in some cases, commercial factors, uh, where substances are produced and distributed like opioid pain medications, which if they were not produced and distributed would not cause the problems that are observed. The overlap between the environmental components emphasizes that it's arbitrary to, to, to distinguish between physical, social, and biological environment, that all of them are part of an envelope that surrounds us constantly in our lives. Another model, which is relatively more complex, but draws our attention to upstream factors that may contribute to the uh, determinants of a complex disorder like addiction is the cascade model. Here we start with factors in the environment that affects often the availability and attractiveness, the accessibility of different drugs. Take, for example, pharmaceutical agents like prescription opioid medications, which have been promoted through a combination of government 
liberalization of prescription practices and commercial manufacturer of products that are highly addictive. Those two factors, when they come together, begin an epidemiologic cascade <clears throat> where corporations are involved in the production of these products, whether it's tobacco or alcohol or addictive pharmaceutical agents, they make decisions aimed at profits, not at public health. Those decisions are implemented through conduits, organizations that help them to sell their products. It could be uh, advertising agencies, it could be lobbying groups, it could be trade associations that promote these products. All of these factors put pressures on the environment. So ultimately, what uh, corporate-born disease uh, depends on is the ability of corporations to produce products that are going to alter the immediate environment, like the advertising that you're exposed to on Facebook, which in turn is going to get you to buy their products. Whether you're a kid, uh, an adolescent, or an adult, they're designed to get you more interested in purchasing those products and becoming a regular user. At the lower parts of the epidemiologic cascade, cascade, once the environment is modified, it interacts with host characteristics and uh, promotes more or less consumption of that product. In the case of alcohol, uh, we know that the genetic makeup of an individual interacts with exposure uh, to produce more or less drinking, and that can result in the level of alcohol-related problems and alcohol dependence. A case study for an epidemiologic cascade model is Finland, where the alcohol industry pressures on the government led to partnerships and lobbying, which changed the government's policies towards the pricing of alcohol, the time at which it could be served, and a variety of other regulatory processes. Uh, once the alcohol control policies were modified in 2004 by a dramatic cut in prices via taxes, there was a big increase in alcohol consumption. And the changed environment that led to the increase in alcohol consumption also led subsequently to a dramatic increase in alcohol-related problems, which then became the most uh, frequent cause of death in uh, Finnish citizens of working age. So particularly males, these government decisions, starting with the epidemiologic cascade, resulted in an increase in mortality and morbidity. So those are some examples of the different models that we can apply to an understanding of causality in the epidemiology of substance use disorders.